This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're looking at Apple's latest notebook computer. This is the 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina display. Now, we've already reviewed the 15-inch model a couple of months ago, and just as it was rumored, it's true. There is now a 13-inch model. A lot of the specs inside start as a baseline with the 13-inch regular MacBook Pro, but here we have all solid-state storage, 8 gigs of RAM at a minimum, and of course the Retina display running at incredibly high resolution and yes it is gorgeous to look at but this doesn't come cheap this starts at $16.99 and goes up to $19.99 for the middle model and $26.99 for the highest end configuration which gets you a dual core i7 and 512 gig SSD so a lot of money is it worth it for this beautiful machine very thin very light three and a half pounds we're gonna look at it now so here it is, 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina display, certainly gorgeous, 0.75 inches thick, a three-quarters of an inch, that's just a little bit thicker actually than the 15-inch model, which is 0.71 inches, and seriously thinner than the regular 13-inch MacBook Pro, which is 0.95 inches. As you expect from Apple, great fit and finish, it looks exactly like the other MacBook Pro models. Fits together perfectly, we have this sculpted cutout here so you can raise the lid easily, we got our glowing Mac. Apple logo over here. Now if we turn it on the side, you can see that this is going to be pretty much a shrunk down mirror image of the 15 inch Mac Pro with Retina display. On this side we have our new MagSafe 2 connector. This comes with a 60 watt power adapter versus the 85 watt that comes with the 15 inch, but you can interchange them. I've already done that. Here we have two Thunderbolt ports, so you can use this with the Thunderbolt display, with the Thunderbolt Ethernet adapter, any other Thunderbolt peripheral that you have. USB 3.0 port, 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, and this has dual built-in microphones. And here we have grill for air intake and also the speakers fire from down here. But despite that, they sound pretty good. And there's a bit of a curve here on the side to make the machine look thinner. And also it gives a little space for the speakers to fire out. Bottom plate, again, looks like a typical Mac. Little rubber feet over here, a little black for the hinge area. Lots of little teeny Torx screws. It takes Torx T5, T6, and T8 to open this guy up. Apple does not really intend for you to do that yourself. We'll talk about the internals more in a bit. And on this side, not as many ports, we have the SD card slot, compatible with SD XC cards. Full size HDMI port, yay, still relatively new for Apple, something for those retinas. And of course, it was on the Mac Mini too, but usually not on the other notebooks. And we have the other USB 3.0 port. Now we've got it on top of the 15 inch MacBook Pro with Retina display here. And you can see, again, the ports are mirrored, and you see the difference in the footprint here. So clearly, this guy's a little bit smaller, more portable. Uh, really, what, what the 13 inch Retina is going after isn't just somebody who wants a higher end MacBook Pro, although to a certain extent that's it in a 13 inch size. This is for those of you who have a 13-inch MacBook Air and have been using it thanks to its great portability, but you've really wanted and needed more horsepower. For a little over half a pound more and just a bit more thickness, you get a machine with a full Core i5 or Core i7 dual-core CPU inside, considerably faster than the MacBook Air. As to which of these you choose, you're going to get a little bit higher resolution on the 15-inch. That makes sense. It is a bigger display, but other than that, the 15 inch gives you the dedicated graphics, a big selling point, I think, especially for the high price points these come in at. The 15 inch gets you the NVIDIA GT650M dedicated graphics, which is switchable with Intel HD 4000 graphics. With the 13 inch machine, just like the non Retina version, you only get Intel HD 4000 graphics. So, those of you who are hardcore gamers, this will not be your machine, the 13 inch. And now we're comparing the 15-inch MacBook Pro's Retina display with the 13-inch. This is what they look like when they are open. Obviously, we have the same desktop pattern going on. Both very sharp, both very stunning. Honestly, lovely displays on each of these. 300 nits of brightness on the 13-inch model, which is pretty good brightness. Not earth-shattering, but not bad either. And as we take a look inside, well, it looks just like a MacBook Pro, doesn't it? Nothing changed here. Exactly the same internals that you would say on, see on the 15-inch Retina or other MacBook Pros. Black bezel. Gloss display, but really reflections are very well controlled for a gloss display, not a problem at all. Stunning, absolutely stunning resolution here. And certainly this wallpaper shows it off a lot with all the detail that's here between the graphs and the zebra stripes. It's almost dizzying the amount of detail that's here. And this is a 2560 by 1600 pixel native resolution display. Now, just like with the 15 inch retina, this runs at um, how to describe it, an optimized resolution with higher pixel density. So it's running equivalently right now at 1280 by 800 resolution, which is nothing to write home about, and I've never been too thrilled with that lower resolution, but aha, uh -huh. because you can choose between running it at the optimal setting 
and scale, you can go into displays here, and you see right now it's best for retina. Now if we choose scale, we can go up to 1440 by 900 or 1680 by 1050, which is the higher res option on the 15 inch standard MacBook Pro. So that might be pushing it a bit. If you have good eyes, it might be okay with you. But I personally really like running this at 1440 by 900. And things still look very sharp and beautiful, and text is still very nice looking. So that's the other thing. This gives you some versatility over the regular 13 inch MacBook Pro or certainly the MacBook Air. You can choose these higher resolutions. And that comes in handy when you're doing something like running Photoshop, obviously. The machine comes with a 2.5 GHz Intel Core i5 CPU, dual core CPU, pretty much par for the course today on Windows machines and Macs. And the base machine starts at $16.99. That gets you 8 gigs of DDR3 1600 MHz low power RAM soldered onto the motherboard, so you can't upgrade that. And it gets you a 128 gig SSD. Ooh, that's not very much, is it? Especially not for your $1,700. But wait, if you want more storage, you can go up to $1,900 and that will get you a 256 gig SSD, which is the starting capacity on the 15 inch Retina Mac, by the way. Now, for those of you who have a lot of money to burn or you want to max this thing out and live with it for years and make sure you get everything you can, there is a $2699 option in stores and that has the dual core 2.9 gigahertz i7 CPU. Again, these are full mobile CPUs. These are not ULV Ultrabook CPUs. But still, it's a dual core. In the 15 inch, you can get a quad core, significantly more processing power available there, especially if you're editing video, doing anything very processor intensive. And you'll get that 8 gigs of RAM, and you will get 512 gigs of SSD storage. Now, everything in here is pretty much designed to not be upgraded. The only thing, for those of you who want to go run over to iFixit and take a look at their teardown, that you might be able to upgrade is the SSD drive, which lives right underneath the trackpad area here. And it's that typical stick of gum looking SSD drive that Apple uses in this area. In fact, there's a little bit extra space. You might even be able to, if you've got a custom connector, put a regular 2.5 inch hard drive in there, a spinning hard drive. I don't know if you want to do that or not, but it's possible. Anyway, RAM is soldered on the motherboard. The airport card, that is the, the Wi-Fi wireless card, that is socketed and removable, but everything else is stuck on board. It has dual band Wi-Fi 802.11 BGN and Bluetooth 4.0. Again, Intel HD 4000 integrated graphics, which is a pretty strong performer, but this is no gaming machine. This is not for you people who want to do a lot of high-end HD video editing and need some dedicated graphics action or even faster CPUs. However, since it is a full mobile Core i5 CPU, it has plenty of processing power to do anything that most of the rest of us need. If you're doing software development, if you're doing moderate work with Photoshop, even the Intel HD 4000 works fine and the Core i5. Certainly your office, your email, all that kind of stuff. For those of you who have a MacBook Air and it's just been not quite everything you need, say, for ripping video, uh, rendering, stuff like that, this will be a lot faster. Well, it's pretty much like getting yourself the 13-inch MacBook Pro, only with a higher res display again, and that fast SSD storage, which only helps to speed things up. Pretty much as we would expect, my 15-inch MacBook Pro with the Core i7 quad-core scored over 12,000. This one scores 7376, which is about Oh, 2,300 points above where my 2011 MacBook Air scored. And you can see the breakdown there. Our integer performance is 5709. Our floating point is 9840. Memory performance is 6061. And memory bandwidth is 7222. So certainly strong performance there. And again, you're looking at something that is in line with the Core i5 regular MacBook Pros in terms of performance. Now, compared to the regular 13-inch MacBook Pro, that starts at $1,199. Obviously, I think there's a reason why that's Apple's most popular Mac, not just because it's 13 inches, but it's also the most affordable Mac that you can buy, portable Mac, that is. So this guy, $1,699 versus $1,199. Aha! Uh -huh. But if you configure that MacBook Pro the same way, say you really know you want that 8 gigs of RAM and you want SSD drive, then you're already looking at $1,499. So you're only paying a $200 premium for the better retina display on this. So for those of you who are set on a Mac and you want a 13-inch size, you know you need more power than the MacBook Air, there it is. $1,699 sounds like a lot, but relative to what you're getting on the regular MacBook Pro 13-inch, that's not really a bad price bump. Now, compared to Windows machines, obviously that's a bit 
painful. Uh, there are not so many 13-inch machines that have full mobile Core i5s in there, but there are a couple. And, and my favorite one for comparison would be the Sony VAIO S13.3. Now that's a pretty special machine among Windows computers because it has a whole lot going on inside. But we're going to give a little comparison right now just to give you an idea for those of you who are still looking mainly to run Windows first. Not for you people who really are into Mac OS. Obviously you want a Mac then. And obviously the other big plus with the 13-inch Retina model is it's a pound lighter than the regular 13-inch MacBook Pro and thinner too, 0.75 versus 0.95. But what do you lose? No internal optical drive. For those of you who rely on that a lot, you'd have to carry an external one around with you. And now we have the Retina Mac next to the Sony VAIO S 13.3, both 13.3 inch notebooks, both have backlit keyboards, both are relatively portable, 3.5 pounds approximately in weight, 16 by 900 anti-glare display on the Sony, but it's not even an IPS panel, it's a TN panel, and when you're looking at it straight on, it's not bad, the contrast is not mm, uber lovely exactly, but viewing angles if you're off angle are absolutely terrible. Clearly the Retina is going to win when it comes to the display. What the Sony offers for about $1,100 to $1,200, though, is dedicated graphics, switch both Intel HD graphics. So you've got NVIDIA GT640 LE graphics in there. For those of you who want a game, it's done well for me with Max Payne, Diablo 3, and a bunch of other titles. And it costs a lot less, but what, are you, what aren't you getting? You're getting a conventional hard drive with the Sony for that price. You can get it with SSDs, but then you're starting to creep back up to the price of this guy. The point I'm trying to make is you can lower the bar, because Apple doesn't offer a lower end config on this, basically. But once you start raising the bar for those of you who want SSD storage, you want more RAM inside, then you're starting to creep back up to the price of this Retina, and it starts to seem, well, I suppose, less overpriced versus the competition. The same is true with some of the new Windows 8 machines that are coming out, where the better configurations are getting close to $1,600. Still, obviously, an expensive investment. Now to finish off the comparison, the Sony has a magnesium alloy and carbon fiber build, so it's quite nice too. And they both have similar footprints, but the Sony's going to be a little bit thicker. You've got to have some room for the cooling for the dedicated graphics. And when we close them up, you can see what they look like right there. The Sony Bio S13.3 also gets you three USB ports and a built-in optical tr drive. Uh, at this price point, you're going to get a DVD burner. You can upgrade to a Blu-ray if you want. It also has a VGA port out for those of you who need to connect to things like legacy projectors and monitors. So speaking of that versatility we mentioned earlier, being able to set your resolution on a display, you can either leave it at best for Retina or run at a higher resolution like we're doing right now, 1440 by 900. I'll show you what that gets you versus using 1280 by 800 resolution. We're going to run Photoshop, which of course is piggish with all of its palettes, useful as they are. So here we have an image, it's a JPEG image from a 25 megapixel Sony digital SLR camera and you can see pretty good speed here. We're going to do some of our usual effects, but notice how much room I've got to work with here. If I want to bring this out even bigger, so I can zoom in on my image a bit, no problem. And apply a couple of image editing things. This will do our auto contrast. And let's rotate that image. These are pretty good. Now let's do a filter on this guy. Just for the heck of it, we'll pick some bizarre filter. Do a lens flare on it. So clearly there's enough processing power here to use Photoshop. Even if you're pretty serious with Photoshop, you're using large image files, applying filters, definitely enough and pretty good amount of space to work with. Now let's go even a little higher here with our resolution and go for that full 1680. And now, wow, <laughs> perfect when you're editing images. Now we've got this much more room to pull our window out here and work with our file. So, nice, versatile, best display I've ever seen on anything ever. Desktop, notebook, standalone display, just really nice to look at. 
How's the keyboard on this? Well, you know, Apple, it's a good keyboard. Not super duper deep key travel, but plenty enough. Very tactile, pleasant keyboard. You're looking at pretty much the same thing you're going to get on the regular 13-inch MacBook Pro, despite the fact that this is thinner. Certainly, if you're used to using a Mac, you're using the MacBook Air or MacBook Pro, it's going to feel comfy. And, of course, it's backlit, and it has an ambient light sensor, so it can adjust the backlighting for you, if you like. Also, it can adjust backlighting on the display. You have your usual row of Apple control keys up here for your keyboard brightness, your display brightness, your volume controls, a little embedded arrow pad right here, and otherwise pretty much the same stuff. And your usual excellent glass Mac multi-touch trackpad. Apple claims seven hours of battery life on the Mac, and so far in our test it's looking like it's going to hold up for that in a mix of use. Now if you're going to be streaming video the whole time, obviously it's going to bring down battery life, but in a mix of using Office Photoshop, web browsing, email, and some YouTube video playback, we, with brightness set at about 40%, which is quite bright because this is a bright display, no problem. The Retina display has 75% less glare reflection, supposedly, than the standard MacBook Pro model and 29% increase in contrast. And of course, since it's IPS, you get 178 degree viewing angles. And we're going to test that out now by turning it, so we'll see. This glare gets in the way too much. A little glare picking up there, but notice how readable that actually stays. Bad for privacy on the airplane, but pretty impressive to show your friends or if a bunch of you want to watch a movie together or read a web page. Really very nice, and the glare isn't too bad. And how far does the display go back? It goes back that far. Which is more than enough given the fact that this is not a TN panel, so you don't have to wobble the screen back and forth to find the ideal viewing angle. It looks pretty much good at any angle you put it at. So how about sound quality? We can hear right now we are in Diablo 3 to test some gaming on this, even though this has Intel HD 4000 graphics, and I wouldn't call this a gaming machine by any means. It's capable of doing some moderate 3D gaming. Most demanding titles, not so much. But you can hear the speakers just nice and full and surprisingly loud. Good job there. So let's take a look at our settings. And let's look at our resolution settings. Right now we have an interesting setting of 1568 by 980 widescreen, but yes, you can go all the way up to 2560 by 1600, which is full native resolution. However, the frame rates are going to be about 14 frames per second. We'll show you just so you can see what that's like. So sure, the game supports it, but it doesn't mean that you want to do it. see us. And down here in the corner you can see our little frame rate is at 13 right now and really nothing's going on. We're just standing here watching the world go by and we're not even fighting anybody. So. Now we have them run around oh, and still holding at about 13. So let's go and change that to something more reasonable. We'll go back to our 1568 by 980. And now you can see our frame rate is at 25. And still managing to hold at about 24, 23 when we're fighting a bad guy. Obviously with games that are less demanding than this, you'll do better. World of Warcraft, easily a go. So that's Diablo 3 on the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro. Our Mac shipped with Mac OS 10.8.1 rather than 10.8.2, which is the latest. So the first thing you wanted to do out of the box was download this 850 meg upgrade to get us up to the latest version of the operating system so we could use all the new iCloud features. Likewise, there was an iPhoto update that was 1.1 gigs and an iMovie if you wanted it. I'm sure at some point this will start shipping with a later version of the operating system, hopefully actually keeping up with whatever Apple has released at any given time. We have the 128 gig SSD, and you can see right here how much space we have free. We have about almost 84 gigs, and that's after installing Diablo, which is 1.1 gigs, big, big game there. 
and also installing Adobe Photoshop CS6, which takes up about 670 megs. So if you're just running Mac OS, that's plenty enough space, honestly, assuming that you don't have a big iTunes library. If you do, you probably want to keep that on an external hard drive. But it's room for enough applications, games, uh, everyday files that you use, some music, some video, of course, on there. Now, if you're looking to dual boot Windows, I would definitely go up to the 256 gig SSD model, even though it's going to set you back $2,000 because it's just not enough space for two operating systems. So that's the 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina display. It's available now, again, starting at $16.99. Certainly a gorgeous machine, ultra portable. Great for those of you who have a MacBook Air 13-inch but always wanted something that's a little bit smarter and you don't mind a half a pound to go with it. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Visit our website for the full review, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.